A couple weeks back, I uh, preached a message called That Man. How many of you remember what that message was about? I hope you got the gist of it, that you are called to be that man or that woman in your world, to be sort of a spiritual superhero, that when Jesus left the earth, he left us to be the body of Christ, and our job as God's children is to make an impact for the kingdom in our own particular world. And I want to talk to you today about your world. The title of this message is Your Gotham City. How many of you know what Gotham City is? It is where Batman fights crime, right? It's not a real city, I don't think. Uh, it's uh, like New York or London. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's just a big, large city full of crime and lots of problems, and that's where Batman does his work. Batman doesn't work in other cities. He works in Gotham City, right? That's his area, and that's kind of what I want to get into your brain is you've got a Gotham City. You've got a world that God has called you to minister to, and if you don't know what that world is or who is in that world, you're going to miss a lot of opportunities. And that if you really want to be that man or that woman, you've got to know where God has placed you in your world. Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Oh, power. What's it for? What's the power for? Is it so we can get goosebumps on Sunday mornings and run up and down the aisles? And talk about how great church was and how we can't wait to get back and get more goosebumps. Is that what it's for? No, it's for you shall be my witnesses. That man, you shall be that man or that woman, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. God has called us to be that man or that woman, his representatives in our world. We have been called we have been empowered to do that job in our world. You need to, child of God, at some point, start, stop looking at someone else to be that man and you to start being that man or that woman in your world. Are you hearing me? We learned that as that superhero in your world, you are charged by God to advance the kingdom, to fight the devil on behalf of other people. To help those who are in need, to stand up for those who've been knocked down and oppressed, to love the unloved, to share the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ in your world. God has strategically positioned you in your family, in your community, in your job, in your country at this time so that you can be that man or that woman in your world. Get that in your head. Now, the devil's going to tell you, you can't do that. That's not you. That's for somebody else. That's for Pastor Harold or Pastor Buddy or Pastor Avery. Or that's for somebody else. That's not for you. Yeah, it is for you. In fact, you have influence over people that I could never reach. Come on. Amen. Get that in your head. Batman fights crime in Gotham City. You have a Gotham City. Now, when we read the scripture and it says Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the remotest parts of the earth, that's a little too big for me. Come on. I, I don't feel compelled to go to the remotest parts of the earth and win the lost. That's a lot of ground to cover, and it's overwhelming, and in fact, it's impossible for me to do. God didn't call me to do all that. He called us, the body of Christ, to do all that. How do we reach the remotest parts of the earth? How do we reach Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Austin, Round Rock, uh, Bastrop? How do we reach Elgin? How do we do all of that? We do it because God has placed us in different areas and we have our own little world, our own little Gotham City that we have influence over. And it's our job to pay attention to our world and minister to our world. All of us can do it. One of us cannot. We have our own little Gotham City. If we're going to be effective as that person in our world, we must know where our world is who is in our world, and we must be intentional about ministering to them. Can you hear me today? Most Christians kind of bumble through life haphazardly ministering to people. But Jesus called, to be, called us to be fishers of men. There's lots of different kinds of fishers, right? Have you ever gone fishing with somebody that don't know how to put a worm on a hook? And they're just there to have fun. And usually if you, like several years ago, we took some young boys from the church fishing and we had so much fun but trying to get them to to catch fish you know it's just impossible you eventually go to let me put the worm on for you 
let me set the bobber for you, and we'll just catch some perch. And then they got the biggest kick out of catching these little bitty perch. You know, it was so much fun for them. But a serious fisherman doesn't need someone to put a worm on the hook for him. He doesn't need someone to tell him when to go, what kind of bait to use, where the fish are at. A fisherman knows. God has called us to be People who catch men, and I don't believe he's called us to be the kind of people who just go and don't even know how to put a worm on a hook and hope that sometime someone might actually come to Jesus because of us. I believe he wants us to be professional fishermen. We know what we're doing. How many of you know that kind of fisherman? He knows when to go, where to go, what kind of bait to use, what he's looking for, the right time of the year, and all of that kind of stuff. But a lot of people have the wrong bait. They can't catch people. A lot of people like, uh, you know, they're trying to minister to people who need love and what they're giving them is condemnation. They're just beating them up with the word of God as if that's going to help them. They're not giving them the word of God in love, right? They're using the wrong bait. Some people need the truth. They've been loved on enough and they're a little spoiled and they need the truth. And the right person knows the difference on how to give Uh, the the right bait. Some people are working in the wrong way. They're doing the wrong things. They spend so much time doing a certain type of ministry that's producing no results because they don't know that's not what the fish in their world need. And some people are just in the wrong area. You know, I've never figured out now because I'm not one of those professional fishermen. I've never figured out why when you're on the, the shore, you throw way out as far as you can. And when you get out in the boat where you're out there, you throw back towards the shore. I don't know what that's about, but some fishermen maybe can explain that to me at some point. But a good fisherman knows where to cast his line. He knows where the fish hang out, how low. Some, some are up on the top of the water. Some are way down low. And I don't know when or how, but if you know what you're doing, you know where to go. Now, some people are fishing in the wrong area in their life, and that's why they're not effective. What I'm trying to tell you is don't be the kind of Christian who just bumbles through life haphazardly ministering to others, hoping that somehow you might accidentally catch a fish. God has called us to be professional at ministry. That is, if we know who our city is, know the people we have influence over, know how to win them to the Lord, know ourselves and our calling, we can be extremely effective for Jesus Christ. Today, I want to help you define your world, your Gotham City. I want to help you develop a deeper love for your world. And I want to help you become more intentional about winning people and helping them who are in your sphere of influence. So how do you define your Gotham City today? Who is your Gotham City? Where is your Gotham City? Well, one thing you got to know is where your influence is not. Where your world is not. Who is not in your world? Now, I'm not in, you know, I'm not in the chapel at Yale trying to preach today. You know why? Because that's not my world. They probably wouldn't receive me because I don't, I, I don't run in their circles and, and I'm not with them. And now, now some people may think, oh, pastor, you could do that. You could do anything you wanted. It's not a matter of talent or ability. It's a matter of calling. See, when you know where you're called, you don't feel bad about being where you are. Because you just know God put you there and he wants you to love people in your sphere, in your world. So you got to know where you don't belong in some sense, where you're not going to have the largest impact. And when you get that figured out, you can usually start to pay attention to who is in your life. Who is in your life? Do you know that part of your world is your family and your friends and your neighbors and where you go to work? And where you go to school and the people who are your friends on social media. And and maybe you have a sphere of expertise that people look up to you and you have influence. Maybe it's where you get groceries or where you stop every week to buy gas. Maybe it's the guy who stands at the door at Costco. I don't know who it is, but there are people in your life that you have influence over. Some of them, like your family, you have a lot of influence over. Some of them, like the guy that stands at the door of Costco, you might have a small amount of influence over. Uh, You know, I go to Starbucks from time to time and study there, or Kathy and I go there just to hang out. And I'm surprised sometimes at the people who work there who remember my name and they remember my drink order and all of that and and uh, it just kind of lets you know that even the smallest of interactions you have with people can have a large impact on someone right it can be the simplest of things like leaving a decent tip 
It could be the simplest of things like saying, uh, telling the, the waiter what a great job they did. Or uh, I'll tell you another one. I've said this before, but this will freak people out. Ask for the manager, and then when they come, tell them how great the service and the food was. That, they'll, just, they'll just go, because all they get is complaints. But you can have an influence even on someone who delivers your food in a restaurant, even on someone who checks you out in the grocery store. If you get influence with someone, a certain cashier at the grocery store, and you feel that you're starting to get some influence, find their line and go through their line every time and start to have a more deeper relationship with them. Be intentional about it. But you've got to start identifying who is in your life. Who do you have influence with? Once again, who can you influence for Jesus? Your family, friends, community, work, school, where you go in life, and who looks up to you, who listens to you, who can you nudge in the right direction? Can I tell you that I've had lots of bosses over the years who were my boss on the job, but in the spirit realm, I was their authority. And when they started having problems, you know who they'd call for help, for advice, for prayer? That's right, they'd call me. And, and I was glad to minister to them because I knew they were a part of my world where I was that man in their world. Are you getting this today? This is who God has called you to be. Who do you have influence over? Where do you have influence? Maybe you have a certain type of career where you train people to learn a certain thing or you do a certain thing and, and you don't see these people very often, but they look up to you because of the expertise you have. Maybe in your community, People look to you. They, they kind of get to know you and figure you out, and they kind of look to you. That's always been the case with Kathy and I. Every neighborhood we live in, the neighbors start to look to us. And when they have problems or needs, invariably, they kind of look to us and start talking to us and telling us what's going on in their life. And it always happens. And I don't know why I don't go knock on the door and say, hey, bring your problems to me. But, you know, it's a part of your calling. And you have to accept that and embrace that. Say, these people are a part of my world. They're in my Gotham City. And I take honor in being one who ministers to them. So I want to encourage you, define your Gotham City. Take some time to sit down and write out who is in your Gotham City. When you write it out, you might start with the ones who are the closest and work your way to the ones who are farthest away. You know what that's going to do? That's going to let you have a defi definition in your mind of who is in your world. It's also going to give you some list that you can pray over. Come on. I would encourage you to do that. Number two, uh, I want you to develop a deeper love for your Gotham City. Matthew 9, 36 through 38, seeing the people, Jesus felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. You know what you are? You're a worker in the harvest. Somebody prayed for you. Somebody prayed for your arrival, and now you're here. You got that? You are here as a worker in the harvest. Now, why are you a worker in the harvest? Because somebody saw, somebody looked around and saw and cared. Now, I know it's easy to look around the world at our friends and our family, and, and some of us are related to some knuckleheads, right? <laughs> and it's easy to be like, look around and see them and think, well, that's their problem. And, and, and I can't believe they do that. I can't believe they live that way. And that's, that's their problem. I got my own thing going on. And you know what? God didn't call us to look around and see them and not care. He called to us to look around, see who is in our world and have compassion for them, care about them. John 4, 35, do not say there are four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. I like that word behold. It's like telling you, hey, smacking you in the face. Pay attention. Look around you. There are people around you who need you. They are in need and you have inside of you the very living God who can minister to their life. Don't say uh, uh, four months. No, the harvest is now right before our eyes. Look around, pay attention in your world, see who's in your world, and care about them. And let me tell you something. you got to be forgiving, kind, merciful, understanding. In other words, you can't look at people and start to be critical of all the mistakes they make and, and the sin they commit. You know what sinners do? They sin. Why are you surprised by that? 
Why are you shocked by that? And can I tell you something else? A lot of people think, well, I can't hang out with those sinners. Well, Jesus hung out with sinners. And can I promise you something? God doesn't need you to protect his reputation. Come on. He needs you to love sinners. He needs you to get around them. Now, here's a problem that we have. Uh, The Bible says God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't die for us because we were so good we deserved it. He died for us even though we don't deserve it. Can I tell you something? You don't love people because they deserve it. You love people because of who you are in Christ Jesus. Come on. You love people because of who you are in Christ Jesus. The world's way says familiarity breeds contempt. That means once you get to know people a little better and you start finding out their faults, you start thinking less and less and less of them. You get to know someone at first and they seem like they're wonderful people. And then you get to know them more and you see them make mistakes. You see them argue with their spouse. You see that their finances aren't all in order. You see that their car is dirty or whatever it is that you don't like. And all of a sudden, the more familiar you get with them, the more you start having a little bit of contempt. Well, they're not all I thought they were. That's the world's way. But you know what God's way is? Is the more I get to know you, the more I love you. The more I learn to forgive you, the more I learn to overlook the problems that you have, the more I learn to be merciful to you and kind to you, the more I dig deep to find the good stuff so I can ignore the bad stuff. Come on. If we want to really make an impact in our world, we've got to breed a deeper love and dedication to those people who are in our world. And yeah, they're going to test you and try you. If you're the superhero, there's going to be times that you got to carry them. And it's heavy. Sometimes carrying other people in your family and in your community and in your job, it seems like you get through one issue with one person and you think you can take a breath and somebody else calls at two or three in the morning and has some other need that they have. And it can be difficult and and challenging. And if it wasn't for the strength of the Lord and the love of God, it would bury us. But you know what? There's a power within us that allows us to be who God called us to be. And the more we get to know people, the more we should develop a deeper love for them. Most of you in here, I've known you a long time, and I could tell you some of your faults. And you could tell me some of mine. But you know what? I don't care about your faults because I see such beauty in you and such goodness in you and such wonderful things in you and and how God has used you and how he's just getting started in your life and how the best is yet to come. And, And, you know, we have to be intentional about that because while the world is defining your faults, we ought to be defining the goodness that we see and the possibilities that we see. We ought to be telling people, you know what I see in you? I see that if God ever got inside of you, he would do something so amazing it would blow your mind and everybody else around you. Amen. We've got to be kind and merciful. We've got to be intentional about ministering to our world. Be intentional. I'm going to list. I think there's about 10 of them here. And if you can't write them down fast enough, don't worry. I've got a sheet of paper that you can go home with that they're listed on. Be intentional. That means don't just accidentally minister to people. Be intentional about ministering to people. Number one, you've got to see them. You got to pay attention. Look around. Who is in your world? The, when you go today and you uh, pick up fast food and somebody hands it through the window, there is an opportunity. It could be the simplest thing as a smile or a have a blessed day. Whatever it may, the simplest of thing. Or you, ha- you might have a relative that you know is going through something and the Holy Spirit might say, you know what? Instead of watching the boob tube right now, you need to get on the phone and call that person and just encourage them in the Lord. Or the Holy Spirit might say, why don't you spend some time in prayer for these people that you know and struggle with? But if you don't see them, you'll never do it. You got to see them, not only see them, but you got to get to know people. There are some people in your world that you're going to have to get into the depths of their life where it gets muddy and messy and it's not always fun. But you got to get to know them well to be able to minister to them well. And if you don't intentionally do that, you're going to miss a lot of opportunities. Amen. See them, get to know them, and love them. Did you know that love is intentional? Come on. We keep talking about falling into love, falling into love, as if there's, you know, we tripped and fell and got goo all over us and loved everybody. 
The truth is you choose to love because God is in you, right? You allow the God that's in you to come out of you through your actions and your words and the smile on your face and the way you treat others, and you don't let negative thoughts come your way. You know, Kathy and I have a habit. Whenever we start talking, we're having conversations. If they start to get to where we're criticizing people, one of us will say, I need to watch my mouth, Lord. Come on. If you don't do that, it's time to start. I need to watch my Lord forgive me. I shouldn't be talking that way. Just find a way to stop yourself. Love them and be intentional about it. Pray for them. Pray for the people. What if the people that you know who are going through a challenge in their life, what if instead of criticizing them, you prayed for them and it changed everything? Come on. What if you prayed for them and it made a huge impact on their life? Not only that, but you've got to defend them. What do I mean by that? Do you know that the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking people in your world that he can devour? And you know who God has placed in your world to fight the devil? You, you've been given power over all the power of the enemy, amen? And it is through your prayers and the word of God and your actions and your deeds that you can defend, amen? You can defend those who can't defend themselves. They may not even know that they're under attack, but you know and you pray and you believe God and God does something miraculous, amen? You can defend them. Not only defend them, but help them. If I ask you today to write down Somebody in your life who's going through something, everyone here could do it. They need help. It could be financial, encouragement, a, a, a new job, a marriage problem, problems with their kids. I mean, problems are everywhere in our lives, and people need help. Sometimes that help means you're going to have to just really get involved with them and really get in, in with them. Sometimes it just means to pray. It just means to pray, amen? Sometimes it just means to just get on your knees and talk to God and say nothing else to no one else about it and watch what God does. People need help, and God wants to help them. And you know how, who God uses? He uses you, and he uses me, amen? You've got to teach them. Somebody's going to have to teach them what the Bible says. The world is teaching them right now. From the very time they're in kindergarten, the world is teaching them things that are ungodly and goes against God's law. And God forbid when they get to university, they're, I think 99.9% .9 of the stuff they learn in the universities now is based on an ungodly worldview. Come on. It's based on an ungodly worldview. Somebody's got to teach people right and wrong. And can I tell you something? I've learned more from people who, who were uneducated in the world's ways but knew God. Amen? And they knew how to live the way it should be lived. Amen? They knew the truth of what God's word said, and I learned from them. Not only that, but you need to be an example for them. You can't tell them God says to love your neighbor and then go around hating your neighbor and talking bad about your neighbor. You can't say God wants us to be hard workers on the job site and then be late for work all the time. You can't say God wants us to love our spouses and, and take care of our families, but uh, run around on your spouse and not take care of your kids. You need to be an example. Part of being an example is letting people see you fail and then saying, I'm sorry, and then getting back on your feet. Once again, God doesn't need you to protect his reputation. If someone says, well, Christians make mistakes, how awful. That is an opportunity for you to say, no, no, no. Christians make mistakes, and that's the beauty of Christianity, that it is the goodness of God that saves us, and it is not of ourselves, and that God would love and care for us. Amen. In spite of the fact that we're not perfect, he loves us. Be an example for them. Number nine, lead them. Lead them. Lead them to a healthier way of thinking. Lead them to a healthier way of action. Lead them to a healthier way of speaking. And ultimately, what you're leading them to is Jesus. Amen? Come on. Ultimately, you're leading them to Jesus. If you don't lead them to Jesus, who is going to lead them to Jesus? I don't know if you noticed, but we're living in a time where sinners don't come to the church on Sunday morning, hear the gospel, and come to the altar and get saved. They're out there in the world. They're out there, let me say that again, in your world. And if you don't be that man or that woman who leads them to Jesus, no one's going to. It's not just for you to be seen. It's for you to be seen and lead them somewhere. Amen. And finally, this morning, Take responsibility for them. Listen, you're not responsible for their sin. 
You're not responsible for their decisions. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you have to look around and say, this is my group of people, and I'm going to, in a sense, I'm going to take responsibility for this group of people for God. I'm going to be God's ambassador in this group of people. I'm going to be the one that they can call on. I'm not going to be perfect, and there may even be other people in their world who do the same thing, but I'm going to be one of those people who's going to represent God to my family. Amen? Who's going to represent God to my coworkers and my neighbors? I'm going to be that person. I'm going to step up and take that responsibility. And when it, there's a situation where somebody has to say, you know what? It's going to be me. I'll do it. You'll do it. Instead of being one of the rest of the crowd who steps back, right? I'm reminded of the armies of Israel. And they had come against the Philistines. And the Philistines had a proposition. Send us your best warrior and we'll send you our best. And the Philistines' best warrior was Goliath. He was a big old dude, man. He was a warrior. He had killed a lot of people. And uh, Israel had an army of people who slowly and quietly stepped back. (laughs) Do we have a warrior who will stand up and be that person? And the whole army steps back and says, not me, not it. But David, David said, you know what? I'll be that man. I'll be that guy. I know God. God was with me. And I was that man when the bear came and tried to get the sheep and in my fold. And God delivered the bear into my hand. And, and I was there when the, the lion came and tried to get the sheep out of my fold. But God gave me the power and I overcame the lion. I'll be that man. And we know what happened. David took that stone and he threw it and he killed Goliath that day somebody's got to take a step forward and say, I'll be the guy, I'll be the girl, I'll be the one who takes responsibility for this group of people. And you can own it. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be better than everyone else. That's not what Christianity is about. It's about you being willing to let God use you. Are you full of the Holy Spirit of the living God? Did he come inside of your life? Is, Is all of God within you? He's not part of God. He's all of God, right? If he's all of God and he lives in you, then you are living out Acts 1.8. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit came upon you so that you can be my witness in your world. Hallelujah today. I'm trying to get you today to understand that you can define your world. Figure out who is in your world. Fall madly, deeply in love with each and every one of them. Root for them. Be the one who defends them and looks out for them and prays for them. And be intentional about how you minister to their lives. And let's watch what God does. Amen. I'm praying for a mighty revival. But I don't think we're going to have the kind of revival we used to have where people come to the church to see God move in the church. I believe we're going to have a revival where you're on your job and someone talks to you about some kind of physical problem. And you quietly pray at a table in the kitchen and God heals their body. I'm talking about that kind of revival where a neighbor comes to you in tears and you minister to them and lead them to Jesus. I'm talking about that kind of revival. God has given us a world, a Gotham City, if you will, for us to have an impact over. And as I've been thinking about that this week, it's, it's been encouraging to me because I begin to think about the people who look up to me and need me and how encouraging it is. How, what a blessing it is. We've got family members and People who live in, in other parts of the world who call on us for prayer. What, a, what an honor that is. We've got people who, who I've never met on social media. Do you know that social media is a great place to do ministry? People say, well, there's so much sin on bad stuff on Facebook. Well, yeah, that's where Christians ought to be. <laughs> you know where the light goes, where it's darkest the most. Amen. And they call on you. And you know what? People are not an inconvenience. They're an opportunity. Hallelujah. Amen. And they call on you. What an honor it is to minister to them in some capacity. Just an encouraging word or prayers that you give them. How uh, privileged we are that people depend on us and look to us. Because I'm going to leave you with this thought. You have a world. God has given you a world. And he wants you. He wants you to make an impact in that world. He wants you to love the people that he's given you. Look out over your harvest field. Have compassion on them, even in their mess, even in their mistakes. Because there was a time when you were in a mess and making mistakes, and somebody looked at you with compassion instead of criticism. Amen? And and it's probably going to happen again. 
Let me just, let me just say right now, forgive me because I'm going to need you to forgive me somewhere down the road. Come on. And you're going to need that too. Look to the people around you. Fall deeply in love with them. And be intentional about ministering to them. Step up. Be that person. When Jesus was on the earth, it was his physical body that the Holy Spirit ministered through. But Jesus went to heaven. He said, you'll see me no more. Why does that matter? Because spiritually dead people can't even relate to the love of God. They can't feel. Sometimes you can just, in prayer or worship, you can just feel how much God loves you. They can't feel that because they're spiritually dead. But they can see it. Why did Jesus came? The Bible says that he became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld him. So that people could see God's love in a person. They need to see it. What does that mean for you and I? Well, Jesus went to be with the Father, and now you and I are the body of Christ. You are who God uses in your world to minister to people. He's going to use your fleshly life to minister to people, right? If you're willing, he will do that through your life, and they can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. They can see the love of God through how you Live, how you treat them, how you help them, how you teach them, how you lead them, how you take responsibility. I want to encourage you today. I really feel like this is where God is leading our church. Not to be a place so much where everybody comes to gather on Sunday. That's wonderful. I love church. But if we gather here all on Sunday and then we just go back out into our world and we're amateur fisher persons, I think we failed. But if we train ourselves in here to be effective out there, come on, and we're intentional and we pray and we we do God's work in our world. We're not trying to be somebody else. We're not trying to be in another uh, pond fishing. We're fishing in our pond where God has placed us and we have an effectiveness for the kingdom of God. Father, I just thank you, Lord. That you have called us, Lord. Everyone just stand with me if you can at this time. Stand with me if you physically can. If you can't, that's okay. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just thank you that you have given us a sphere of influence. A Gotham City, Lord, you've given us a world that is ours. You've placed us in it. And we ask you to forgive us for maybe wanting to get out of it. Because there's been problems or Stuff that we don't want to deal with. And and we ask you to forgive us for maybe being blind to it. We're not paying attention to the people in our lives. Father, we ask you to forgive us because sometimes even when we see the problems that people go through, we've just been uncaring and we just go on about our lives and leave them to themselves. And Father, we forgive. We ask you to forgive us for not being intentional and active in ministering to the people around us, Lord Jesus. And today, Lord, we just want to get those people in our thoughts. Every one of you right now, I want you to just think of one or two or three people that are in your world today. Maybe they're people that you know are going through something. Just let them come to your mind. Just a small example of the people in your world. Oh, thank you, Jesus. 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 And you, these, these are people, have you ever cared about someone and did so much for someone and other people were critical of you? They're like, why do you care about that person so much? Why do you care about them so much? You know why? Probably because they're in your world and God has called you to. And that's the Holy Spirit in you. Think of those people right now and let's just lift our world, your, your world. You lift your world up to Jesus today, Father, in the name of Jesus. I just lift my world, my sphere of influence, my Gotham City up, Lord Jesus. And I ask you right now, God, to just touch those people, Lord God. Help me to see them. Don't Help me not to be the kind of person who misses it, Lord. Lord, help me to have a deep love and compassion for them. Help me to be uh, forgiving and merciful and understanding, Lord Jesus. And Father, I pray that you'd help me develop a daily plan to influence those people in my world, God. I thank you for it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I pray that our church would have that mindset, Lord, that that our world isn't just in here. Our world is out there, really, God. And I pray that you'd give us a burden and a hunger and and a courage to step out and take responsibility for the people in our world in Jesus' name.